Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I am an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Providence College. This is a lecture on David Schweikert's After Capitalism, Chapter 4. We will be talking about inequality, unemployment, overwork, and poverty. There are four lectures that come before this one. I hope you look at those first, and then there will be several others to follow after. And I hope you have the opportunity to look at the whole uh, lecture series on after capitalism. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about how to interpret Tina, or the idea that there is no alternative to capitalism. We will briefly look at uh, behavioral consequences in the workplace if we adopted Schweikert's uh, idea of economic democracy. And then we will look at three problems that arise in capitalism and Schweikert's argument for how economic democracy will resolve these problems. And those are inequality, unemployment, overwork, and poverty. The next lecture will consider three other problems uh, in addition to these four. So Tina is uh, short for there is no alternative to capitalism. And Schweikert begins by talking about, well, what does this really mean? Uh, and generally, we take it to mean that uh, capitalism is the most efficient uh, economic system, that it allows the most dynamism and growth, and that it is most compatible with liberty and democracy. But what really happens is we gloss over, over uh, seven problems when talking about uh, capitalism as a better option. And what we typically mean is that there are no preferable options uh, out there. And so what uh, Schweikert wants to do is start to consider uh, alternative options to capitalism. Uh, and to do that, he wants to show that these seven problems, for which we will discuss in this lecture, are causally connected to capitalism. That is, capitalism either causes these problems or increases uh, the problematics. So he wants to follow Marx, who says that capitalism has made a truly human world possible, but we cannot enter that world without transcending capitalism. So the idea here is not that capitalism is totally bad and hasn't brought us any good things. In fact, uh, the idea is that it has brought us something good, uh, a way of making the things that we need so that we can live in a truly human world. But it also comes with a variety of problems that we have to overcome. And that is what Schweikert is trying to propose uh, in his book, After Capitalism. To consider what we're talking about, though, we want to keep in mind that democracy is at the heart of our discussion of economic democracy, and particularly democracy in the workplace. And that comes with a, a variety of uh, behavioral consequences if we were to adopt uh, economic democracy. A uh, first would be a reluctance to reduce labor costs. Second, uh, we would not possess an inherent tendency to expand. And then there are other corollaries with economic democracy that follow uh, from those. And the idea here is to remember the framework from within which, from within which we are saying that uh, there is an alternative that is better than capitalism, and it is this economic democracy. And whereas Capitalism wants to reduce labor costs. Uh, economic democracy does not want to reduce labor costs. So it does not vote to uh, cut income in order to save money, and it rarely votes to lay off workers from our uh, experience. Uh, second, uh, most firms within economic democracy will not uh, have a tendency to, to expand uh, for two reasons. One, uh, you're not going to increase uh, the profit per worker, and that's what's important uh, within economic democracy. And uh, second, if we bring in more workers, then that dilutes uh, the power of my voice within a democracy. Uh, so there's a limit to how far uh, we might expand uh, a firm in economic democracy. So firms will be typically smaller, less intensely competitive, and uh, monopolistic tendencies will be less pronounced. Now, the first issue we want to talk about is inequality. And Schweikert tells the story about a parade uh, where there are dwarves 
uh, followed by larger people, followed by giants. And this is a sign of uh, inequality or a story that really tells us about inequality uh, in the world today. Most people in America uh, really have a, a poor picture of the actual distribution of income and wealth uh, in the United States and in the world in general. And there's a recent video on CBS um, Morning uh, called The Pumpkin Pie Cut. You can look at that video online just to see how uh, people in an ever everyday circumstance think about inequality in America and then what that inequality is really like. But for Schweikert, he wants to imagine that there are thousands, uh, even uh, millions of people down here in the uh, very short, uh, even an inch off of the ground uh, area uh, making money. Many, many mil millions. And slowly, uh, slowly, if we have this parade uh, representative of people uh, making money, we see that uh, even though they get uh, larger, there's many, many, many more millions of people uh, in these low economic divisions until finally we get a few giants, some so high that they can't even see uh, the ants that they would be uh, stepping on if they march forward. And that's really a good image for what economic uh, inequality looks like in the United States. Uh, inequality uh, is separate from poverty. Uh, it has its own problems. Uh, so Plato, for instance, says that inequality corrupts uh, people in both uh, uh, stratas of society and also that it undermines the unity of society. And what we've seen even more recently is research that shows uh, that it is bad for both physical and mental health. Uh, in light of this, I'd uh, recommend that you watch a uh, video series. You can find it online for free called Unnatural Causes, which looks at the research behind this. Uh, but basically, for every strata in uh, society, uh, each strata suffers worse health outcomes than the strata above it. And part of this, we think, is due to the stress levels, uh, which are extremely high uh, in the United States, but also in other uh, unequal uh, societies. So Schweikert wants to say that democracy is always a check uh, to inequality, uh, and so if we adopt economic inequality, I'm sorry, if we adopt uh, economic democracy, then uh, we will keep a check to this inequality. And uh, you can just think about the uh, image here on the right where the uh, workers are holding up uh, the really tops at the capital in the capitalist system. Um, his proposed inequality is 10 to 1, which is much less than the inequality that we see today with the giants and the uh, ants in our parade. So the goal here is a genuine democracy. A second problem is unemployment. And Schweikert makes a, a nice argument, uh, and in fact a true argument, that unemployment is necessary for capitalism. Uh, the key, of course, as we saw in earlier lectures and earlier chapters of this book, uh, for uh, growth is effective demand. It is not investment, it is not wealth, it is effective demand which leads to growth. Uh, but for that to happen, people have to be able to, to buy things, right? That's where the demand comes from. And that means they need a fair salary, a living salary in which to uh, buy the things that are needed uh, so that growth can happen. Uh, but in fact, what we see under capitalism is that labor is considered a cost. And so there's always an attempt to cut uh, the pay to workers, which actually lowers demand. And that leads to this cyclic uh, crisis that we have seen since the beginning of capitalism 400 years ago. Uh, and it's happened in the 20th century every 10 to 15 years. Uh, this gets worse. Uh, I'm sorry. This uh, doesn't get resolved by the Keynesian economics uh, because Keynes says that we have government step in to help increase demand. But of course, that leads to the growth of inflation, which we saw in the 70s. And that uh, also leads to uh, crises. Capitalism requires, in essence, a permanently unemployed group so that they can keep wages low. Uh, and this allows there to be a reserve army of the unemployed and so that the workers are always fighting against each other 
rather than uniting. And in terms of fighting against each other, the capitalists can always press down wages uh, other, because they can always say, I will go hire someone else. Uh, since 2007, 2008, uh, we've seen a lowering of the unemployment rate in the United States, uh, but that has just been replaced by the underemployed. And so we see lots more of the precarious positions in, uh, in the world uh, come to fruition with, for example, Uber and Lyft, where people are underemployed. Uh, and so they're, they're working, uh, but they're not working at the capacity to develop their skills. Under economic democracy, unemployment disappears. Uh, it disappears not necessarily uh, because the worker cooperatives are hiring. Again, we saw how worker cooperatives might be less likely to hire, uh, but they're also less likely to fire. Rather, economic democracy works with the investment banks that we talked about in earlier chapters, sending money into communities where there is unemployment so that employment rises. And secondly, we uh, take as a valid this universal right to work in economic democracy. That means, of course, that government must be the employer of last resort, but it is better to have a job than to be on a welfare check. Um, and under economic democracy, unemployment is not necessary for worker discipline because workers are sharing in the profits of their firms. We also have the problem of overwork. Uh, in capitalism, which we do not have in economic democracy. Uh, capitalism leads to more competition, which means that there's more intense efforts, and these uh, more intense efforts are just efforts to re remain in the same place rather than growing. So even though we talk about uh, the possibility of a consumption leisure balance uh, in relationship to work, uh, in fact, this is difficult to attain uh, under capitalism. Uh, so hours of work, for instance, are fixed. Uh, the 9 to 5, for instance, or working the 40-hour week. And uh, secondly, uh, people in cap under capitalism tend to adjust their consumption so that the leisure uh, is no longer a real option. Uh, and thus we have the growth of, growth of things like uh, binge-watching TV shows because there's nothing else that people can do uh, in their leisure time. In fact, what we see today is that the average employee spends 200 more hours working on the job uh, than they did 30 years ago. So in fact, capitalism leads to overwork uh, rather than to a better uh, work-life uh, leisure balance. Under economic democracy, technological advancements might lead to less work. Uh, and uh, where under capitalism, workers have no choice on what happens with te technological investment. Under economic democracy, Workers have a choice whether they want to take more time off because the technology allows more efficient work or however they want to keep uh, that under wraps. Uh, and there are two reasons for increasing leisure, of course. One, it helps us to keep everyone fully employed under uh, economic democracy. And two, it's necessary for ecological sustainability. The last issue we want to deal with is poverty. And poverty it needs to be contrasted with being poor. You can be poor and still not be malnourished, have health care, have a home, uh, and, and not be hungry. Poverty is suffering from malnourishment, homelessness, and hunger. Uh, and this is a spiritual as well as a material uh, problem for us in the world. And the only cure to poverty is actually decent work. And though uh, many people will say that capitalism has actually reduced the number of uh, the uh, people in poverty, what has happened is China's protected market socialism is what has led to the greatest dro uh, drop in uh, poverty. In fact, all we need we need to see that uh, half of the world's population lives on less than two hundred and fifty a day, and we can alleviate that poverty by simply taxing the 0.01%, one-third of their income, which will leave them even more uh, than $8 million a year in income. And that would solve global poverty and would lead to greater economic democracy. These are the first four problems that we're looking at that result from capitalism, and we will look at another three in the next lecture.